You can't talk about 1970s photography, particularly uh, from 1976 onward, without bringing up this camera, the Canon AE-1. If you were involved in photography in the late 1970s, uh, you definitely knew somebody who either had a Canon AE-1 or perhaps you owned one yourself. Much like the Pentax Spotmatic of the 1960s, the Canon AE-1 was, was the definitive camera for many photographers from 1976 through the early to almost in the mid-1980s. This Canon sold nearly 6 million copies and probably was, uh, I guess you could probably say, the most popular camera in history. Uh, actually, I don't know the sales figure for every model that uh, ever was released to the market. But it certainly uh, had its place in photography. I knew of many, many, many people, many friends and um, some relatives and also just acquaintances who had this camera. It was a very popular camera and for good reason. It was very simple to use. It gave you sharp photos and, uh, you know, had enough flexibility where you could really build upon the system if you wanted to. There, there certainly was nothing wrong with this camera. Uh, I never owned one, uh, you know, until recently, but I always uh, certainly understood its place in photography and its impact on photography. So the Canon AE-1 is described as uh, being important because it's the first camera that had a microprocessor, that is a computer chip, to control the camera. The, the camera is fully battery dependent. That is, without a battery, uh, the camera is not functional at all. You cannot release the shutter. There are no manual shutter speeds uh, uh, available. And uh, if the camera, if the battery dies, you really are left with a non-functioning camera. This is a standard 35 millimeter SLR with uh, interchangeable lenses using Canon's uh, FD, FD mount, which at that time was a breech mount. Uh, later it went to more of a modified breech mount, really just a bayonet. And then at some point in the 1980s, it dumped the FD mount entirely and went with its uh, EOS, EOS mount. The Canon AE-1 also is notable because it was the first mass-produced camera to widely use uh, plastic in its construction. The top deck and bottom deck are both injection molded plastic and then painted with or, or then coated with uh, um, a metallic paint to give the appearance of a, of a metal top deck. This camera could be operated both in automatic exposure or fully manual exposure modes, depending on what you wanted. It had an electronically controlled shutter release, although of course this part was manual where you press the shutter, where you press the uh, button. The aperture ring had an A setting, and usually and you had to press this small button, turn it to A. So that made it a shutter priority. Well, before we dive too deeply into things, let's take a quick tour around the camera. So this top tack is fairly standard. Uh, over here we have a your shutter speed dial. Here you have a small window for your film speed selector. This is your frame counter right here. And here's your shutter release. Pushing this outward uh, gave you a, I believe a 10 second delay. That was your self timer. Once again, electronically controlled. No manual self timer in which you move the lever downward. I believe this is the battery check button, traditional hot shoe, and your folding rewind crank. On the back, you simply add your eyepiece and your little frame holder to hold the end of the uh, box of film so you could remember what type of film you had loaded into the camera. Flash synchronization uh, port. A lot of these cameras, including this one, would have a small little cap. Sometimes it was screw in, sometimes it was push in but it was just a little cap to protect the uh, port. So we'll put that back in. Here you had a couple buttons for, um, for exposure compensation. I can't remember what this one did. This is your depth of field preview lever. Uh, this camera did not have mirror lockup. But considering that this camera was intended solely for the amateur market, uh, that probably was a feature that not, not many people cared about. In fact, I don't really rec recall any of my friends or acquaintances who own this camera saying, gee, I wish it had a mirror lockup. On the bottom, 
this would be um, these these would be a contact points for um, your film winder. This is not a battery chamber uh, port. What this is is this is your um, your coupling for this would be your mechanical coupling for the uh, film winder, the film advance, rewind button, and here is your tripod socket. Notice that it's not in alignment with the center of the lens. Again, probably a feature that most uh, buyers, probably amateurs, didn't care about. So let's open the back and take a look inside. Pop the back open by simply pulling up on the rewind lever. And in the back there are no surprises. You have your, there's a small spring to keep the uh, film cartridge in place, keep it from rattling around. Uh, there's a small roller here that guides that uh, guides the film across that guides the film onto the various uh, parts of the film advance mechanism. This is your pressure plate, and of course the role of the pressure plate is to keep the film flat against the film rails. And uh, when the shutter is released, it will record as sharp a photo as possible because uh, the film is flat against the film rails. Here's your uh, spindle with your sprockets for your sprockets, and this is your take-up spool. This has a small serration to help you get things started. As with most cameras of that era, it actually wound the film so the, ex the, so the emulsion was on the outside. This used a horizontally traveling cloth shutter. Now you'll notice that I advanced the film, and as I mentioned, there's no way to release the shutter because this was in fact, an all-electronic shutter. Speeds ran from 1 1,000th of a second down to 2 seconds plus B. We're going to pop in a battery very quickly here so we can release that tension on the shutter and to talk about the shutter. This is your battery chamber, so to open it you simply push inward and then lift up. Very simple. And you'll notice there's a little, fo there's a little drawing of a battery that shows you which way to orient the battery. So plus side is up. The easiest way to insert the battery is to put the negative side in first. Push down toward the bottom of the camera because that little plunger is sprung, this little contact point, and then the top will slide in. Always use a lithium battery and not, a, not an alkaline battery. All right, with the battery in the chamber, see, now you can release the shutter. Because of the use of uh, plastics in certain parts of the shutter, this camera had what was what is now referred to as the, the uh, notorious Canon shutter squeak. I attempted to repair it, however, I put too much oil on it, so I'll need to address this at some point. And how you uh, repair it is, there's a small mechanism probably right around here, and you need to add a single drop of oil. I think I may have added two drops and it got into the uh, mirror release mechanism and as you can hear it's much uh, slower than it needs to be. Outwardly this camera is uh, very attractive you know has nice markings on it. I believe this was available in black as well although uh, most cameras you see today are going to be this uh, chrome camera. Prior to the uh, to the modification of the FD mount this used the old style breech mount which was you turn the ring at the base of the lens all the way to the left counterclockwise until you heard that small snap and just simply lifted the lens away from the body. And to mount the lens you line up this red dot with this red dot on the camera, turn the ring until it can't turn anymore, essentially tighten it like you would tighten the lid on a jar, and you're done. It's a fairly quick way to mount the lens, although I, I think some people still felt it, it was a bit clunky, and that's why they went with this modified breech mount, which really was just a bayonet mount. The viewfinder display was fairly simple. On the right side was a small scale running vertically, and it just showed uh, the various apertures. The aperture scale extended from 1.2 to f22, although, you know, depending on the lens you had, th that 1.2 certainly wouldn't be available. There were several LEDs in the viewfinder. There was a, a, an M to show if you were on manual exposure mode. There also was a needle that would float up and down as you changed your uh, shutter speed. 
The film advance has a small standoff position here. And it was ratcheted. So if you wanted to, you could advance this film in very tiny increments. Or you could do it in one stroke. I think by and large people just did it in one stroke. This generally was a fairly reliable camera, probably through most of its life. Later in life, I think it began to develop a few problems here and there, notably the, the, the shutter squeak that I mentioned before. Today you will see a lot of uh, Canon AE-1s on the market. Some of them, however, are not functioning. And I don't know if it was the electronics because, you know, they were damaged by poor storage or what, but you do see a lot of non-functioning AE-1 cameras on the market. So always keep that in mind when you're planning to buy. Size-wise, this is a decent size. You know, it's not too large and it's not too small. Compared with the Spotmatic, a very popular camera from the 1960s, the Canon AE-1 was actually about the same size, shoulder to shoulder. Now if you put them back to back, you can even see that it, this might be ever so slightly uh, narrower than the Spotmatic, although they're pretty darn close. Uh, the Canon AE-1 is does have a thicker body. And you'll see that this is uh, somewhat thin, and from back to uh, even you know flange. Or if you look at where the uh, flange is for the film or for the lens, the lens flange to the back, you'll see that it's not nearly as thick as what is here for the Canon AE-1. Regardless, for many reasons, the Canon AE-1 was never thought of as a full-size camera, even though it was fairly close to full size. It was really just thought of as, uh, it sort of became, this really became every man's camera. As I mentioned, if you were involved in photography from 1976 onward, you either knew somebody who uh, used the Canon AE-1 or perhaps you owned one yourself. And if you were out um, doing touristy type things in a tourist destination, you would always see somebody with Canon AE-1. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, Canon of course, supported the e AE-1 with uh, a large, large staple of lenses because, of course, they had the Canon F1, which was its uh, camera for the professional. So it had plenty of uh, lenses and flash units. Uh, this one also, as I mentioned, had a film advanced. I don't know if it had a motor drive. I, it did have a winder. Uh, I don't know if it had a motor drive. The difference between a winder and a motor drive is a, a, a film winder might advance it at maybe one frame per second or so, whereas a, um, a motor drive, those generally would do three and a half up to three and a half frames per second, up to maybe nine to ten frames per second. So for the average person, you know, they it just um, it really just eliminated that need to advance the film manually. I never had a problem with this. In fact, even today, I still like the whole process of advancing the film by myself. Let's take a look and see what this camera weighs. All right, so the Can Canon AE-1 tips the scales at one pound, 12 ounces. 12 ounces is what? It's one and three quarter pounds. Because I've spoken about the Pentax Spotmatic, let's compare it to the Spotmatic. The Spotmatic really tips the scales at, I think we could just say two pounds. So the difference in weight was really just four ounces. And even though it's just a four ounce difference, the Spotmatic really feels um, much, much heavier than it should. Yeah, it, it's real weird. It's sort of weird that the Spotmatic feels that much heavier than the uh, Canon AE-1. So if you're looking for a Canon AE-1 today, uh, normally I don't actually put this in, but if you're looking for a Canon AE-1 today, keep in mind that this camera did suffer, this model did suffer from what was known as the shutter squeak. And that's something that you can uh, address yourself or have somebody uh, take care of it for you. There are numerous videos out there uh, on YouTube that show how to uh, take care of this. 
ignore the ones in which you spray WD-40 in, inside the um, inside the camera. Uh, WD-40 should never be sprayed into a camera. Ever. Ever. As you always should, see if you can get a look inside the battery chamber. On this one, the door is sort of broken, so I'm going to have to address that at some point. But see if you can get a look inside the battery chamber and make sure there's no corrosion on the contacts. And just generally check the condition of the camera. With nearly 6 million uh, of these sold during its lifetime, there's no reason to buy a camera with uh, problems. There's just no reason to. There are enough of them on the market that you should be able to buy a camera that has not been damaged. Also, remember that it's very likely, in fact, almost a certainty that you're going to have to replace the foam seals on this camera. Not a difficult job, and I have a video that explains how to do this. And so here we are, the Canon AE-1, one of the cameras that defined photography from 1976 onward. Much like the Pentax Spotmatic of the 1960s, the Canon AE-1 was, for many people, their entry into photography. It was a very solid, reliable camera. It was attractive, it looked fairly modern, and it, it suited the needs. It often was the only camera that many people had. The Canon AE-1 had enough features for the beginning photographer, and it had plenty of features for those who uh, began to learn more and more about photography and wanted more control over the photographs that they took. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please think about hitting that like and subscribe button. If there's a camera you'd like me to talk about in the future, let me know in the comments below or send me an email at contact at camera-talk.net. Until next time, keep on taking photographs.